Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Episode 49, Putting the Heart Back in the Valley by Putting the Fire Back in the Ground, featuring Bobby Fossick. Cove, Oregon, is a tiny town in the eastern part of the state that most Oregonians haven't even heard of. Surrounded by fields of conventional monocrops in the heart of conservative ranching country, it seems an unlikely place for leading-edge cultural transformation, and yet it is thanks to what might strike some as an unlikely partnership between Native Americans and the Episcopal Church. I first visited Cove and met Bobby Fossick and his family in the summer of 2017. I was traveling through the area with a friend on a foraging and wild tending mission that also took us to Hell's Canyon. Bobby's place was our base camp for a few days of picking and processing cherries from nearby trees, and we cooperated together in setting up drying racks and running their steam juicer. Bobby is a Walla Walla and Yakima descendant from the Umatilla Reservation. In his youth, he picked up some traditional knowledge from his father, but it wasn't until later in life that he committed more fully to learning and practicing the skills of his ancestors. Perhaps ironically, the Episcopal Diocese of Eastern Oregon provided the particular means to do so that he is now pursuing. The diocese is based in Cove and has been running the Ascension School Camp there for decades. Bobby attended the camp regularly during his childhood because his father married an Episcopalian woman. As an adult, he visited the place again and heard that the diocese wanted to, quote, right some wrongs with the indigenous people whose land they were occupying. He inquired, and they ended up inviting him to be part of that effort. The background on this invitation is that, at its general convention in 2009, the Episcopal Church passed a resolution repudiating the doctrine of discovery and calling on congregations to support efforts by indigenous people seeking respect for, quote, their inherent sovereignty and fundamental human rights, end quote. Here's to hoping that other Christian denominations will also take up this banner to make up for past behavior. The diocese now provides Bobby with the salary and housing, as well as making the camp's facilities available for cultural events that he helps organize. It's an inspiring story of real cooperation and a sincere attempt to make reparation. Bobby and I conversed on December 30th, 2020. We talked about the ecological restoration he's doing at the camp and in the surrounding area, and how it encompasses more than restoration projects typically do that are sponsored by universities, governments, or nonprofits. Going deeper than just the science, Bobby's work is rooted in the traditional knowledge of his ancestors and includes cultural values and language as essential elements. As he summed it up, you can't restore the landscape without restoring the indigenous presence. If you appreciate this episode, please share it on social media. If you'd like to financially support the podcast, you can make a one-time donation at paypal.me slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I, or become a member at patreon.com slash colibri, where you will get early access to most episodes and other exclusive content. The music you are hearing is by Dr. Dreamchip of Portland, Oregon. See show notes for how to follow their work. Now here's my conversation with Bobby Fossick. The recording begins with me reading something he'd recently written on social media about the necessity of place-based solutions. Restoration of habitats and regenerative localized food production need to be foundational in our economies moving forward. We should be turning resources towards these efforts with the same vigor the destruction and depletion was carried out with. Sucking the life out of our lands while polluting the water to grow human fodder void of nutrition and send it overseas to the highest bidder is a march towards extinction. And most are chained to this way of life by the corporate oligarchies that have more rights than human beings or the very sources of our lives. Many of us know and are implementing place-based solutions 
that ensure a future for all. So place-based solutions, that in itself right there is, I think, a phrase that's probably new to most people. Uh, that, that I could go a lot of ways with just that right there, of talking about place-based and people's lack of understanding of what that means. So, yeah, I don't, where would you like me to begin with that? I guess in terms of how you yourself are working on things with your job out there and then also with the Caretakers of the Land project. I guess I think one of the problems that we're facing, well, you know, all the problems we're facing, I think, are symptoms of a greater problem, which is disconnection from place and uh, disconnection from the natural world to such an extent that uh, we really don't understand how the world around us works, how it functions, and uh, and then the need to teach ecological literacy as a, uh, a principal foundation, I think is highly important because we've really been uh, forced into having to put a lot of focus into reading the written word and to the point that we've almost gotten educated out of context of place. And, you know, for a long time, uh, people existed pretty well you know there are many societies here in this area and uh that really flourish and uh, based off of place you know based off of the knowledge of how how the ecosystem they inhabit functions and you know our, our stories from the beginning of time till now always sort of leading us to reflect on the natural function and to prevent, to make choices that prevent um, depleting our food sources and ruining the habitat and causing uh, these struggles that we're facing for the future generations of what happens when you start to remove keystone parts of an ecosystem and the subsequent collapse that follows, you know, and sometimes it's pretty slow. And, and so, uh, you know, place-based solutions, I think one of the problems we're facing is that there's a pretty uniform, uh, you know, everything's globalized and and one size fits all. They're trying to blanket the whole world with, you know, really one size fits all solutions and uh, ways of managing the landscape, you know, ways of building, you know, cities and without consideration of how those places function, you know? And so it's a society destined to collapse that doesn't uh, have any thought towards the function of the, of its sources of life. And so, you know, getting back to place-based solutions, I think is crucial because every unique habitat niche serves a crucial role for the, for the entire planet. It's not that the entire planet isn't, connected it's all inseparable but everything is distinct and serves its function and what what is you know the way of life over here isn't going to be the same as the way of life over there it's uh you know just like in north america there were hundreds and hundreds of, of various cultures and societies and and with a long you know thousands of years of history of uh ways they interacted with one another things that most of us you know, we'll never know the changes that they saw. And, but, you know, uh, everything always revolving around tending to the place you're in, you know, and understanding how it functions and, and uh, which is one of the reasons why people were resistant to uh, this colonial settler expansion was because they, you know, at first, most people, there was a lot of people that really wanted to, uh, work with and share the space with a lot of the early homesteaders and settlers. And, you know, it was like just nation to nation. Yeah, we can, we can all pass through these places and enjoy the abundance and the beauty of these places. But once you start to make choices that um, break those natural laws and that will inevitably create struggle and, and scarcity for the future generations, then, 
you're going to be asked to stop. And when you ask someone to stop what they're doing, they take it as hostility. And, and I, I feel like a lot of conflict and stuff kind of, some of it stems from, uh, you know, people just speaking up for their land and for their families and trying to protect them. And anyone would do that. You see it happening all the time still. And, but for different reasons, not for, because of the longevity of, of your home or for the sometimes for the seemingly for the love of your family. But so back to this place based, I don't know. I feel like I'm carrying on, but it is such a broad topic that goes so many different directions going back to the doctor to discovery. Right. Right. Well, how about we take it back to the place that you are in? Because you said in this place. So talk a little bit about like where you are there in the Blue Mountains area of Eastern Oregon and like your roots there, maybe. And then we can and then we can come back to it from that direction. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I am currently in Cove, Oregon, as it's called now, which sits on the uh eastern edge of the Grand Ron Valley in northeast Oregon. So kind of at the edge of the valley and the base of the Wallawa Mountains and uh, homelands of the Cayuse, Umatilla, Walla Walla, Nez Perce. And uh, yeah, and I'm from the the Umatilla Indian Reservation near Pendleton, Oregon, which is west of here about 60 miles or so in the foothills of the Blue Mountains. So yeah, that's where I'm at. Right. And in Cove, you uh, are working at the uh, Ascension, what's it called? The Ascension? The Ascension School Camp and Conference Center. Right. Yeah. Right. I, uh, so really long story, you know, but how I got, came to be that I'm connected with this place. Mm-hmm. Uh, my father uh, married an Episcopalian woman when I was a child. And this camp is run by the Episcopal Diocese of Eastern Oregon. And so as a child, I ended up going to camp here and uh, I was always kind of weary of Christians because of, you know, the long history of people using the name of Christ and calling it Christianity while, you know, snuffing out anyone who stood in their way of industrial progress. Um, So I was always weary, but at the same time, I love this area. I always love coming to this area that is Cove and traditional summer grounds of Cayuse, Walla Walla, Umatilla, Nez Perce people. Um, and so coming here in the summer, you know, it was like a genetic memory thing. It just always loved being here. And uh, and people were are really open-hearted and open-minded in the Episcopal Church, the diocese. And um, so anyway, fast forward to being an adult. I hadn't been here in, in a long time. We'd been traveling around for a couple of years and it'd been quite a few years since I'd come and visited this place and uh we were living on the opposite end of the valley and came over for a a work weekend and we heard them talking about um so i just wanted to come reconnect with the camp here and uh overheard people talking about the doctrine of discovery and how uh, the episcopal church had uh made the resolution to repudiate the doctrine of discovery you know, publicly and openly and stating that they feel that the doctrine of discovery goes against the gospel of Jesus Christ and is an inherently racist doctrine that goes against any of the teachings that Jesus was hoping to share or convey. And uh, that they wanted to start trying to right some of those wrongs and reconcile beginning with uh the indigenous people whose lands they were occupying as well as with uh, African-American descendants and uh, just starting with the, you know, starting locally. So place base, starting where they're at, where their headquarters are, which is here in Cove, Oregon. And so we were there, you know, and our family is, you know, I'm a Walla Walla and Yakima descendant. My family's Cayuse, Umatilla, uh, Klickitat. Seminole. Um, so we we have a lot of connection here to this place uh, ancestrally and genetically. And and so we were here hearing them talk about that. And it was like, well, where are you guys going to start? And they're like, well, we don't know. Do you want to come and start 
<laughs> helping us out with some projects and nice. <laughs> and so they were wanting to start uh, restoring some of the landscape back to native habitat, bring back some of the native plants. And so that kind of began that relationship. And so we came out here, uh, they invited us to start helping out and then eventually offered us a, a home that we're in now. And uh, this is like our base camp and uh, offered us a home and a salary to start helping with some of the maintenance. Then through a lot of, uh, you know, over several years of talking and working together, um, a lot of ups and downs, you know, it wasn't always easy, but we worked through a lot of stuff together in that process of, uh, of them trying to figure out what it is, what it means to reconcile with the native people, the lands they're living on, you know, and inhabiting. And so it brought us to the point now where we're working to restore, uh, or revitalize 80 acres of their land holdings here in Cove, Oregon, that is a part of this campus. It was, uh, traditionally, it, well, the first settler, Samuel French, he planted it as a plum and cherry orchard. And some of that is still remnant along the edges. And then, uh, but for the last 70 years, it's been rotation of uh, wheat every five years or so, and then alfalfa for a year every now and then. And uh, so we've begun bringing back the native uh, bunch grasses, and we're going to uh, reestablish camas, which was a pretty uh, predominant plant species in this area. And through the prop, uh, through the land, there's uh, several streams and springs, and that's the native place name of this area referred to the abundance of springs and streams here. Some of them were geothermal, and so there's some warm springs here and hot springs nearby. Um, so it was a well-utilized area and shared area among many people. This area is really abundant, and so we're working to restore some of that abundance on the land that was just, uh, that was farmed with wheat for the last 70 years. And the uh, uh, stream channels were pushed into diversions and straightened and, you know, uh, the wetlands and seeps drained off just like the entire valley was. And uh, so we're starting by revegetating it with the prairie species as well as the riparian species of you know, cottonwood, red osiers, all the willows and dogwood and, uh, you know, service berries and choke cherries and currants and uh, hawthorns and elderberries and you name it. And uh, as well as tending to the existing fruit orchards that are still here that have kind of gone feral that you've eaten from yourself. Right. <laughs> so I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh so, yeah, we're just trying to bring back that some of that abundance and diversity and kind of tend to the stream there a little bit because it's traditionally fish rearing habitat that was all, you know, turned into irrigation diversions. And um, some fish still make it up there, but, you know, they have a heck of a time, you know, now that the whole valley has been changed drastically and that they got to make it up the Snake River dams to get even to the Grand Ronde and, so the natural systems of this region have just been cut to pieces, you know, on the surface, people think it's still because of the trees, there's still a lot of conifers and, you know, the mountains still look beautiful, you know, when the sun's rising and all that. But mm -hmm. as far as the function, the long-term function of the landscape goes, it's been pretty well uh, butchered. And so, uh, the confederated tribes of the Umatill Indian reservation, they got, restoration projects going on all throughout the the watershed and ODFW and so there's you know some large scale projects to revive some of the natural function and you know we're working in collaboration with the Episcopal Church to work on some of their land and at the same time we're also developing a, a nonprofit organization right now working with them to start uh, raising some funds and whatnot but eventually going to start our own and uh, called Naknui Thlama Tichamna, which uh, means caretakers of the land in Umatilla. And, Can you uh, say that again? Naknui Thlama Tichamna. That means caretakers of the land in Umatilla. Mm -hmm. And that's our uh, pending name of our organization. You know, uh, 
But so what our focus will be with that is to continue doing more uh, sort of small scale restoration efforts like this one, get this one going and keep, we have a few other ones in the works and around the region and uh, as well as doing land immersion camps uh, and revitalizing our seasonal round life way, which um, takes us from, you know, the low country in the winter time. And then as spring emerges, you know, and our first uh, celeries and roots start coming on in the low country and uh, working their way up, you know, we follow them up back up into the mountains. And so we're kind of working it out to where uh, this will kind of be our summer base, like it always has been, you know, for a lot of families and people in this area. And, you know, but instead of coming back for all these foods, we're coming back to revitalize some of these foods. A lot of them are still here near and around in the mountains and stuff, but the Camas prairies and what it was has been totally changed. There's species that are missing entirely from nearby. Um, there's still some populations intact, like bighorn sheep, you know, used to live up in all these ridges and rim rock, not anymore. They have a really hard time because they shared the diseases with all the domestic sheep and goats and and you know the whatever turns the most profit takes precedence typically and and so you know it's kind of a sometimes painful when you understand how the system works to see how it's being treated and abused but you know we just find our purpose in trying to repair some of that while repairing our our way of life which is directly linked to because our, you know, our stories from the beginning, our creation story and how we came to be is all centered around taking care of, of our ecosystem, of, our, of the natural function of this region particularly. It doesn't teach us how to take care of the East Coast. You know, it doesn't teach us how to take care of you know, anywhere but here, you know, the, on the Columbia Plateau and then understanding your watershed. So I think, you know, this old societal function, I think, plays a vital role in adapting moving forward as we, uh, you know, are trying to find ways to get us out of this mess we've created, you know, because food scarcity and poverty, it's all man-made, you know. If we follow natural law, we're going to be okay, even in times of, of hardship. You know, there's cycles of, of famine and stuff, but they're exacerbated by us, you know, by by us changing away from a natural law way of life you know the salmon are still trying to keep up their end of the deal all the time you know right. they're always going to try to swim back to the mountains and it's us who have you know neglected them and and you know through force and through you know force assimilation and you know long history of hardship between the united states government and the many societies of this region um, and I say many societies because it wasn't just a couple tribes, you know, it was many, many nations that lived, you know, that had their ways of dealing with each other. And, you know, it wasn't always perfect, but we took care of the land the best we could. And if we ever were forgetting that, you know, all we had so much of our society was around not forgetting how to take care of the land and, and so now we're locked in these cycles of consumption and all of our land is, you know, the majority of our land is, has been flipped and, you know, instead of that energy that is in that land that shows up in those foods and in our local ecosystem, instead of that nourishing us, it's being shipped down our damned rivers and shipped out to port and out to sea to go to wherever and I should have said in that post, I should have said human and animal fodder because, you know, how much of it is used to go to feedlots, you know, right. which is sad because the cattle in this valley have more rights than most humans. And so there's no reason why we should have to buy our protein from anywhere. We have enough protein in this valley to feed all the local inhabitants between the beef and the elk and all the animals. And if we restore the habitats, Cattle can still periodically graze through some of those places, but it has to be in smaller scale and not for profit-minded, but for local local uh, 
uh, food security minded, you know, and feeding your neighbors healthy food and, and trading with them for what you, you know, for your financial or whatever, but having a healthy, I feel that having a healthy ecosystem, everybody can be taken care of, you know, because there's, there already was enough for everybody, you know, like I said, there's times of scarcity, but between the Buffalo herds and the salmon and, you know, all the many foods, there's enough for everybody. Our taste buds are pretty spoiled now. A lot of people won't ever want to eat some of that stuff, but. The thing, the thing about a lot of the contemporary food is that it's been designed, you know, in fact, to be addictive, you know, like right. they go into right. laboratories and they're like, Oh, let's work this out. So that, so that this really gets people coming back for more, you know, and let's go further than that. They, they work on the smells that are released, you know, right by restaurants, right? Like, so like I haven't eaten at a Kentucky fried chicken in like, I don't know, probably 30 years or something, right? You know, and and I, I wouldn't, if I ate that at this point, I would probably get sick. But you know what? If I'm driving through town and I'm hungry and I drive by one of those places and I got my window down and I smell it, I'm hungry. I want to pull over because they've yeah. scientifically have like developed that smell to like, make you know to make to just so it'll get that reaction you know so so there's I, I, and i tell that i'll just to say that you know it's not just about us and our choices that we're making but about how we're being coerced you know right and that's the sad well. part mm -hmm. sorry to interrupt but it's no, just, no, I was, I was it done. goes to show that um because i talk about all this stuff you know and it gets it's disheartening sometimes because when i'm out you know in the ecosystem and I can see its needs and I can see, you know, it seems like it's so simple. Like if we really want to just have our basic needs and then some, it seems so simple to localize our food sources, localize our food economy, like, and rejuvenate our habitats that can already feed people naturally by as a byproduct. And then if you interact with it properly, you get what you need while helping it to flourish. But and then you look at these little things, like what you just pointed out, and it just goes to show how much of this society is really not based around health or well-being or anything like that. It's based around maximizing consumption all the time and always increasing consumption rates and always making sure that people are, that pattern's increasing. Like you see, people developing, how do we make their sense more drawn towards it so they'll come buy it more how do we right. keep their attention coming back how do we make more to meet the demand that we're increasing you know keep them and so it's all about and that's where some of these ideologies you know some people for us our our spiritual and physical beliefs are rooted in uh, reciprocity with the landscape where some people's religious ideologies um, have them thinking that Jesus isn't going to come back until they ruin everything. Right. So they're hell bent on it, you know, and in the meantime, they're creating the, the very hell that they brought and, and created and designed. They're creating it right here on earth, trying to get to some idea of heaven that um, was already on, here on earth before they turned it into hell, you know, right if you don't mind me bringing it back to the valley that you're in yeah. there um that like like I, i've been through there a few times and you know it was all like wheat and i remember there was also a good deal of chocolate mint which was kind of interesting like fields and fields of chocolate mint but it was all products that were uh intended to be commodities to be harvested at once from these monocultures and then basically shipped off to be used for other things. Like the chocolate mint is used for flavoring or whatever. I think maybe even in toothpaste, bubble gum, right, right. That kind of thing. Right. And then the, the wheat is, you know, maybe some of it's going to humans, but then uh, uh, maybe some of the, I, you mentioned alfalfa too, that's going to animals obviously. But before that was there in the Valley, there was a lot of chemists there, for example. Right. And I think that right. you told me the story once of how, um, when the European uh, settlers or invaders, however you'd like to call them, first came into the hills above the valley and looked down into it, the camas was blooming, but they didn't realize that's what it was and thought they were looking at a lake for a moment, you know, Yeah. from, from all the blue flowers. And it's like, wow, that's just an astounding 
you know, vision to think of. I mean, first of all, like so many valleys all across the entire hemisphere, of course, had a similar story. Like right. there was incredible abundance that was in these valleys everywhere of first foods, like just different kinds everywhere that all just got plowed under for different commodity crops as soon as those, the, the you know, the, 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 the settler colonialists came in, you know? And, and, you know, I think that that's something that most people, most contemporary people don't realize, you know, city people, like they come out and they're like, oh, look at the country. It's so beautiful, you know, just because everything's green. And I understand that green is a relief to eyes that are used to just looking at concrete all the time. But of course, right. the valleys have really been hammered harder than any place else, you know, like because they were the places that was good for agriculture, you know. So now you're there and it's, uh, you know, the, the Episcopalians are, you know, very serious you know, about, about wanting to make reparation, you know, and that's wonderful to, to, to see. And now you're, you're planting back there. And one thing you did this year that I saw that you did that was really encouraging was bringing the camas bake back to the valley. So I thought maybe you could uh, talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like you said, this valley, was full of camas because the where the Grand Run River is a huge water system tributary of the Snake comes from the Blue Mountains and the Elkhorn Mountains, and it would snake through the valley, met up with Catherine Creek and a bunch of other streams and lots of marshes, ponds, and it flooded almost yearly, and but that charged the the whole system up, and it was full of you know tules, cattails, camas, lots of lush grass. Um, so people mainly came here in the summer for those, you know, because there's plenty of grass for, you know, once people were traveling by horse primarily, you know, at the same time that the foods are coming on in the summer up here and it's getting hot down in the low country, there's grass, there's camas for days, like, and, uh, and so the camas bake would have been a huge, you know, occurrence where, and, and the, at the same time, you know, families coming from all these different directions to come and meet up here and bake and gather camas. And so kind of like a family reunion type, you know, a lot of weddings. And mm -hmm. so it was a really important and sacred area throughout the seasonal round of many different families in the region. And, uh, you know, so along with the removal of most of the camas and with the removal of the people, you know, um, so there's a pretty sad history of interactions between settlers and and the the people, and there was a massacre, you know. And then people started coming back, and then kind of stopped coming back in the '60s when the fish stopped coming back because of the Dalles Dam and the Lower Snake River dams and all the habit, all the spawning grounds being turned into irrigation diversions or drained off entirely to prevent flooding and uh yeah just a perspective it's like this valley was like a eden a garden of eden to most of the people around and then when the settlers came they called it a waste prairie and they said this will be you know pretty good land once we tame this waste prairie and tame these you know wild waters and and so uh <clears throat> yeah in revitalizing canvas you know for us revitalizing the knowledge of it and uh, where it is still existing, what its needs are there, um, how to, you know, how to gather it properly, how to process it properly has been a big deal for our whole community over the last few years. Uh, many different elders and teachers have been, you know, our language teachers and culture keepers have been working hard to, uh, gather up as much knowledge of it as they can from families and people that have heard stories from other people. Cause there's some families that still kept the traditions of canvas baking alive. And, uh, but then when was it? 20, 2018, the tribe's uh, language program did a trial run and, and baked some canvas. And then in 20, I believe it was 2019, uh, as a community, we baked camas um, with the, the the language program's culture camp, and so we baked it with all those kids, and it was just 
beautiful experience bringing back that practice because it's an art, you know, how to properly bake it and the different ways you can bake it and what the outcome will be, you know, with the different methods you apply or it's a lot of layers and you got to have the right rocks and you got to have your timing right. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the process, like from what it's like to harvest the plant and to, to just kind of walk us through it? Yeah, it's really a long, you know, a long process because you got to know where you're going to get it from. You can't just go pick it up wherever. And um, and then you got to know how that place is looking. You got to make sure there's no death canvas there. Uh, if there is, you got to flag it because it has a, you know, it's a pretty distinct species, but to the, you know, once it's gone to seed or if the tops have been eaten off by elk or sheep or cows and, you know, it's, it can be hard to tell if you haven't been monitoring your fields. And so, right, because the death canvas has a white flower. Yeah, it has a white flower that looks pretty distinct, but the seed, you know, it it, it, it could be hard for someone who doesn't really know it that well. And, right, and right. then the bulb looks identical, so it's like, um, so you got to be careful and know where you're digging, and then, uh, uh, which you know isn't the easiest of things, um, but highly enjoyable. So even just going out to dig and re- reconnect with some of the places around that have this this root growing has been really nice. And last year we went out and. Sorry, I get on, on a tangent. You want me to explain the, the process, but yeah. Um, so yeah, then once you have the camas, you know, there's certain ways of, you know, different people do it different ways of getting it peeled or whatever. And then uh, you have to make a pit, make a pretty big pit oven. And in that oven, you have to cook rocks, you know, get the rocks red hot. Then you got to do a layer of, mud and grass and uh, native mint and then you bake the food in between that then you do another layer of mint uh, great basin wild rye grass and then uh, more dirt back on top you put the fire back on top and then you that fire burns for three days so like I was saying you know um, in this valley, you know, and around it, people were coming together that haven't seen each other in a while. So, you know, uh, three days having that fire together where it's very practical and everyone brings their, their digging that they've gotten done so far. Everyone brings it together and bakes all their food together, you know, and uh, like a, not just one family was cooking only their food in my pit, you know, or whatever. It's mm-hmm. like, cause it's a lot of work to, to even do any of it. So, of course it's a communal activity and so we uh yeah that three days of tending that fire day and night just creates a lot of opportunity to have deep connection and create that culture that i think we're missing in this fast-paced world so for us starting with revitalizing the camas culture of the blue mountains has been a huge starting point over these last few years because like i said our community did it together and had a canvas bake for our culture camp and then this last year we decided that we were going to do it here in cove and kind of bring the practice back to this valley because that's always been something that has been on my heart ever since i you know because i i've always lived back and forth between the foothills of the blue mountains and around pendleton area and then this valley like that's always been my home since I was a baby. So it's like once I learned about how the land did function and how Camus was a huge part of life here, it's always been on my heart to bring that back, to start restoring Camus wherever I can and to learn again how to cook it, process it. So this has been a, you know, throughout a lot of my life, think this has been on my heart and mind. And this is the first, these last two years were the first time that we've, actually baked it and ate it, you know, and, and it, uh, when we did it as a community, that was the first time our community, you know, a collective of predominantly Cayuse, Umatilla, Walla Walla descendants had baked it together. Um, and then last year, baking it here in the Grand Ronde Valley was, as far as we know, maybe the first time in close to 100 years that that practice has been done here. So we like to, you know, think of it as that we put the heart back into the valley by putting that fire back into the earth 
and cooking that camas in the belly of the mother again here. And, uh, and as we plant those seeds of camas and bring it back, um, and it still exists in some places around, but just not in the uh, abundance that it once did. And so, yeah, the camas, the, the knowledge of it, going and gathering it and baking it has become a, a focal point for our revitalization efforts because that alone gives us, you know, something to work on most of the year. Because when we go out to gather camas, we're not just gathering camas, we're gathering uh, our wild carrots and other summer foods as well. And but, and then that three days around the fire, baking it gives us an opportunity to really connect and pass on a lot of teachings and uh, share a lot of skills and knowledge. Uh, last year, we were only able to have a small group of mostly family due to the coronavirus, but on into the future, we hope to make it a, a yearly event for our community. Um, the Ascension School, part of their reconciliation and reparation efforts are to allow us the use of their campus and facilities for any of our revitalization efforts. So like the Camus Camp, and we'll uh, be working on buckskin making here and just doing various, using it as kind of our base camp in the Grand Ronde Valley, uh, staging camp, and then also a place to do some of these events and uh, good jump off point for a lot of places around this valley. So in the mountains surrounding it. And uh, yeah, so we'll be doing it again next year, going out and spending two or three weeks out digging and probably take, go out with our horses and, uh, try to get, you know, we want to get our community involved as much as possible with coronavirus. It's been kind of hard, but um, we'll see what the next year looks like. But yeah. So that the lifestyle that existed there, you know, and of course all over the continent, but, but there in particular where you know about it, it was just so different than the lifestyles that people have now. Um, in, in, in so many different different ways. And it seems like there was one way to talk about it was just that there was really this focus on uh, food and on the gathering and the processing of food uh, communally, it seems like in most, in most cases, you know, and uh, moving around on the landscape as well. So, so you didn't have uh, just a house you know what I mean? Like people didn't have like a place they lived year round, you know, and, and you were, you'd be in one place in the summer, you'd, you'd travel, you know, to follow the different things to follow as, as different, as different food was, 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 was available, you know, and then there'd be all these different communal um, processes that would happen, you know, in different places. And then these all had different, rituals for want of a better word that went on around them and then different i i'm assuming songs and all this that happened to i mean once i start to think about this life and try to try to imagine it i'm like well that sounds like a hell of a lot better than what we're doing now i mean just a hell of right. a lot more enjoyable i mean honestly yeah yeah that's you pretty much described it um you know there were places that were permanent year-round camps that you know i imagine were a lot of elders stayed there and but yeah for the most part people followed the foods around and and uh so part of our efforts too are to revitalize those trail systems you know and, and figure out where they're still connected where we can still make that way of life happen and networking with landowners in between that want to work together and finding the public places. So lots of scouting and, but cause it, you know, all those connections I think are super important, including the being able to move through those places and go to those places. Cause at one point you, there would just be at all these uh, usual places such as here, there'd be just poles stacked up in trees, you know, for the next, for whoever, you know, uh, grindstones everywhere tools everywhere you just kind of clean them and ask if you can use them you know kind of pray over them and use them and uh you know and I, I imagine people didn't always get along all the time but you know 
it does seem to me like a much better system and everything about it was rooted and always brought you back to remembering how inseparably interconnected we are with the natural system here and how the natural function is a barometer of our health too. You know, people always say the the health of the salmon and the health of salmonids and adramus fish entirely is like our barometer for how healthy we are and how healthy the region is. And, you know, the only reason why there's any fish in the rivers is because of hatcheries and crutches and, you know, various means like that. You know, if it were, they would have a hard time if it were just up to their own. And they're, like I said, they're, they're still trying to make it up to the mountains every year. But once they hit that hot water, once they hit those, you know, pools of bass and walleye and, you know, they have so many challenges before they can get all the way up here to the Blue Mountains or any other headwater tributary, you know, in the Northwest faced with so many challenges and so are we you know so um part of our adaptive response is uh how do we start removing some of those obstacles you know how do we start encouraging free flowing rivers and free flowing trails and how do we encourage uh places throughout our homelands and in our usual and accustomed areas where we can safely go to and safely have a, an encampment, you know, and, and revitalize these doings without fear of, uh, you know, you know, there's a lot of trauma around it. A lot, you know, it wasn't that long ago that over 50 of our women, children and elders were massacred just on the other side of the Valley while gathering food. So it's hard to even, you know, uh, for some people to even want to come over here and gather their food, you know, just being here is, uh, cause those people that massacred those women, children and elders gathering food were a lot of them were volunteer settlers. You know, there is some divide at that time over letting, letting us live our traditional way of life. And some people just like, Nope, if we keep letting them, let's just be, you know there'll just be skirmish after skirmish or whatever so but so yeah it's facing a lot of stuff even just to move out to back to a place like this and to start you know uh, revitalizing how the land functions you know i've definitely had people try to stop it and uh but i can't you know i can't stop doing this because I just couldn't go the other way, you know, so. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. In the part of, of, of where you are out there in that area is also a little bit unusual compared to other places in the United States in that certainly compared to the East Coast and the Midwest, the colonization was much more recent. It was just right. in, the, in the late 1800s into the beginning of the 20th century. And then another thing that's unusual in a positive sense in that area is that um, when the reservations were made, they were made by shrinking the land that was traditionally your land rather than say on the East coast where they just got picked up and sent away. You know what I mean? Like, you know, the Cherokee getting driven out of the Southeast, the Southeast United States and being sent to Oklahoma to someplace where they didn't know any of the plants or any of the animals, no traditions at all. I mean, so, so, so there's, there, you're, you kind of have both things there where a, it's a fresher memory of, 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 of the traumas, but then also a fresher memory of the, the life ways. And you actually have some physical space still intact. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of that is because our ancestors put up a hell of a fight to not be, because they wanted to move people down south into the desert and you know a lot of different ideas of where to where to move us and our ancestors fought for fought to not be moved and so um like chief joseph chief joseph was one of them right chief joseph the cayuse you know uh lots of different people you know uh, you hear about chief joseph a lot there's a lot of different people that that uh, made a lot of sacrifices for us to be here the way we are today and to make sure that to reserve, you know, uh, 
in those nation to nation agreements in the 1850s uh, to not say, you know, we please let us, you know, but we reserve our rights to hunt, fish, gather, graze, camp. And if any of those things become uh, inhibited, you know, then that's like going kind of going back against. And so that's why, you know, there's such an adamant effort to uh, restore our waterways and restore our foods and preserve what's still there. Cause yeah, there's still some areas intact and, uh, so yeah, there is a, there is a lot to be grateful for here in this region of that there is still that connection to our subsistence ways of life where yeah, on the east coast some other places that had been changed drastically a long time ago. So 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 there at the at the Ascension School camp where you've got the the 80 acres there that you're working on, you pretty much have free reign over what you want to do there. Yeah, for the most part, um, I lead, you know, I lead the effort and, um, you know, I call in a lot of different people in my life for guidance and help and consulting and trying to figure, make sure we're doing the, making the best choices, but I fall back on, you know, our traditional ecological knowledge, 90%, you know, to a hundred percent and then reaffirm with, with, with our, with experts, um, you know, about different methods we're using, but, but yeah. And, and so the, through grants and through donations and through their funding, you know, we got resources. And so that's, what's pretty cool too, is they're uh, not only putting us kind of in the lead of it, but then putting the resources behind it so that we can make sure that we're getting good seed and getting good plants. And, you know, which is cool too, because in the process, we're kind of, seeing through experience how, you know, it can be good also for the economy, you know, like in doing this, we we're supporting the local native plant nursery and we're, we have a walking trail through part of it, part of that project. So the community is able to come and walk and enjoy it and be a part of it. And, um, but yeah, yeah, we pretty much guide the ship. So on the, on the choices with that land. So Right. And then what you sort of envision over as time goes on is that you'll have different activities basically going on year round that people from your community can get involved in. Yeah. Yeah. The, the Ascension school is a, it's an outdoor school facility too. So like um, hopefully over the years, the local public school system can come out and we've had a few classes come out kind of before we got the project started, but cause they also have a big greenhouse and garden here. And so and another cool thing that kind of came about out of uh, the COVID-19 situation is that uh, the, the summer camps got canceled last year. So instead the director of the camp hired some interns and had them go through some pretty strict kind of COVID-19 regulations to make sure keep everyone safe, but then they got to stay here for the summer and work on various projects and uh, got paid a stipend and helped with the restoration efforts and helped in the garden. And so it inspired the director to then next year and from now on to just have interns throughout the summer that um, are here primarily to work in the garden and to help with the restoration project and learn. So it'll be a cool way to get just have another option out there for some people locally that want to uh, come get a feel for what, what that means through this perspective where it's, you know, kind of a different, not necessarily just restoration, but a, a combined effort to revitalize uh, indigenous presence in this area through bringing back some of these uh, doings and, and the habitat that supports these doings. <clears throat> but to have them be directly helping in that effort too. So, you know, shaping our own community and our uh, youth, you know, so that they being a part of these efforts, I think really helps to shape, you know, 
our future leadership, as well as uh, shaping future allies that come out and learn and, and take part in these efforts. So, yeah, and then we're going to have uh, some various camps here and um, probably lots of planting events in the fall and stuff. But yeah. well, And uh, language is going to be part of it too, right? Yeah, language is crucial. You know, I, didn't, I haven't really touched on that, but yeah, for us, because the language is – comes from the land you know is and so you can't restore the landscape without restoring the indigenous presence and you can't restore our indigenous presence without revitalizing those languages that hold the key to a lot of a lot of aspects of of how the how the land works and how our relationship is with it and so um yeah language revitalization is huge and we're we still have a handful of affluent speakers and teachers, but, you know, and, and more people learning all the time. So, yeah, part of it, and that's kind of part of our efforts, too, of why we decided to take it a step further by creating a nonprofit, not, not to work, to work in collaboration, cooperation, and just as a, to create more reach, you know, in these areas that are within our usual and accustomed homelands, but not on the reservation, you know, to uh, start creating more access and opportunity in these places. What's the process like of trying to bring a language back from just a few speakers? Well, um, we're kind of subject to using Zoom, which has been kind of nice because for us living over here, we don't get to have like all the time interaction with our teachers like we would like. Um, Eventually, we're gonna we're gonna make a winter base over there, and we're gonna focus in the winter full time on almost full time on language and various crafts. We homeschool our daughter, so you know, we're pretty flexible, and we and we keep a lot of this these doings as the some of the major foundation of how we homeschool even in our seasonal rounds. But so yeah, we hope to by next year have a winter base camp. All of our family lives over there, so we'll set up a base camp over there for part of the winter. And, and we're hoping that by just immersing ourselves in it as much as we can, we can retain it. Um, they're teaching it in the school. Our tribe has a, Oh, okay. Their own edu, you know, they handle, they have their own high school and started. Oh, 10 to 15 years ago, I believe it started. And, okay. uh, and it's gotten pretty, kind of the double-edged sword of, of building a modern economy is that we've kind of regained some of our sovereignty in that way that we've taken control of our own education and mm -hmm. a lot of different means of um, taking care of ourselves financially. So the education over there is pretty, pretty good and incorporates language from what I, from what I understand incorporates language into the daily doings, but you know, and for a person like me, I've found that hands-on and and while living is the best way to learn. So I've been able to retain a lot through being, you know, and our tribes also created, it was like a 15-year-long project, and they released it a few years ago. The Chow Pawa Lakni means uh, they're not forgotten, and it's a place names atlas, oh, a cool. native, native place names atlas, so... And since that book's come out, they've so many more stories have come out about different places and names. So hopefully, eventually, maybe make another edition. But because um, the language and the, the place names are kind of like a hint, you know, like a, a track that was left, you know, to remind us this place is known for having a lot of this or this place. We went here for that, you know. And so that'll tell you what time of year we were there and what we were there for. and. Um, and then the foods, you know, all the foods and the plants and the animals and learning their names while gathering them. And, and yeah, through the various practices that go with them, like, because, you know, for every step of the process and most things, there's certain words you use and certain songs you sing for different things that, and so um, that's kind of what we have found that the best way to retain it is through doing it. And, and so that's why we're working towards having this seasonal round immersion uh, program where we 
throughout the entire year have various opportunities to be immersed in what we would be doing at that time, what we are doing at that time of year, what the original laws guide us to be doing at that time of year. And just doing that in a immersed setting, you know, camping there, being there for more than just in and out, you know, like we're going to be at these camps for two or three weeks at a time. People can come out for the whole time, you know, from our community or come out for, you know, if they're not used to being out there, they can come out for even a visit or a day or, you know, we'll have case by case basis in getting people out to, to experience it. But, and then raising money so that we can fund our language teachers to come out to these camps too. Cause you know, a lot of times they get, you know, survival a lot of times, you know, I think a lot of people would like to get back to doing a lot of these things, but different people are on varying levels of just survival. And so a lot of times, you know, money is a limiting factor. So raising some money so that we can um, fund it well, and so that we can get the teachers out there and that we can have the time to immerse ourselves in it so that we can retain as much as possible and be teaching what we know as we go, you know, I'm a very beginner speaker. I, I'm, I'm very, I'm like in kindergarten, you know, preschool, but, um, you know, it's a start, you know, and I know the names of some place, you know, knowing the names of some places and all the foods, it's a good start, you know, and so I think by revitalizing our way of life, we can revitalize the language. And by revitalizing the language, we revitalize the way of life. And by revitalizing that way of life, we're going to restore the landscape because our way of life is a, is a part of that landscape. That, that Like we talked about, that uh, way of existing that was given to us as a gift in our creation you know, was when we first came here, we didn't know how to quite how to take care of ourselves and the salmon stood up and all the aquatic species and, you know, the, the deer stood up and all the animals of the land and the birds of the air. And then uh, Piahi, the, the bitterroot stood up and then all the roots stood up following her. And then the huckleberry stood up and all the berries stood up, you know, and taught us how to live here and taught us what their needs are. And, and our diet is so intertwined with those foods. Like, you know, these modern foods are terrible on our health. All the health problems we have today are rooted in separation from our way of life and, and taking on this modern diet, you know, and then the depression that comes from living disconnected and all those things. So it's like for us returning to this way of life and trying to put resources towards it is just, to us, it seems good for everything in the system, you know, because the land wants the people back, you know, the people want to go back to the land, you know, um, our bodies need it, our minds and our hearts need it. It's just a whole system healing, you know, um, that needs to happen. And that's where I found it is in returning, you know, sometimes the feelings are hard to sit with that when you see that the land isn't functioning properly and that, Oh man, I really, it sounds good to go live this way of life again, but most of the water's polluted, you know, like I can hardly find a place to, you know, filter water out of sometimes because it's so dirty. It's like, that can be disheartening, but then it gives you a sense of purpose. Well, now I know what I'm here to fight for what I'm, you know, because those, that job was given to us in the beginning of time too. We will take care of you if you take care of us. And when the time comes that people don't remember how to listen to us, that we've separated our consciousness from that shared consciousness with the rocks and the fish and the, and the, the birds and all the animals and the water that, that someone's going to have to speak for them, you know, but someone's going to have to stand up for them. And so it gives us our, our job to do while we're here. Right. And, So that's what we're working on. Yeah. And just one more topic I kind of wanted to ask you about, which is that, of course, the world is is changing now, too, in some other ways. And you've mentioned a lot of environmental destruction that's happened. And, of course, 
you know, some of that I think can be cleaned up. I mean, dams can be taken out and waterways can be refreshed and all that kind of thing. I mean, even soil can be cleaned up. At the same time, we're also dealing with climate change. And so there's the possibility that not everything that once thrived in a particular area is still going to be able to thrive in that in that area. And I, I believe that you're also, I mean, I know you're also aware of that and thinking about that and all of this too. Yeah. And, you know, I think with that, the only kind of buffer we have for that is to take care of our ecosystems and to bring back our, our natural habitats. Like, that's the only way we're going to even begin to reverse any of that. And that's that same thing of, like, the the land and, the you know, all the creatures, uh, all the other inhabitants, they, they're not, they can't change, you know. The deer is always going to be a deer. You know, it's us who have changed and have exacerbated this scarcity and, and it's causing larger scale change to happen, you know? And so I think the only solution I can find is to uh, take care of those, those buffers, those, uh, you know, all of our, all of our, and that's why place-based is so important because every, not every place is going to need the same, uh, it's not going to need the same things, you know? So, and it's all, you know, from grasslands to, you know, shrublands to forests, you know, it all needs to be addressed in its own certain ways. And that's why I'm always pointing back towards um, the indigenous place-based societies, because you would think that after thousands and thousands of years, we might figure something out about how the place works. Right. You know? And so right. <laughs> in those ways of life, in those languages, in those lies, the key to how the land functions and how to, and yeah, there's some changes in the climate that are causing, you know, habitat niches to move and different things like that. And I think even that, a lot of it is just so, I don't know, so human driven that. So I think there are some different responses that, you know, we're going to have to make some adaptation. Like, you know, we don't have the fish, the quantity of fish, and it's going to, it would be quite some time before we ever got back to the, where, you know, even people that didn't, that at that, those times didn't eat a lot of fish were still eating like, a lot of fish, you know, so it's like, right. uh, uh, it was still a major part of the diet for people that even didn't eat very much fish. So in relativity, and it's going to be a long time before we ever get back to that. Yeah, it could happen pretty quick once, if the lower snake river dams were gone. Um, but then those fish are so polluted, you know, so I think it makes me ponder on a lot of these things like, Okay, so if our traditional source of fat and stuff is go is diminishing, I can't turn my back on the fish because they're I can't say, oh, I'm just gonna act like that this is never gonna be salmon country again, because then I would be breaking those laws, you know, and not following like we gotta tend to the to the function of it, you know, and that is our solution, like tending to the function of where we're at and how that land functions and, you know, tending to our part of that whole system. And, but it makes me think, you know, that there's some different, different things we can bring in and work with as adaptation measures that will create some food security while simultaneously uh, helping to restore some of the habitats that are necessary for some of these keystone native species like the salmon and the bighorn sheep. And, you know, so that's why I'm always, you know, kind of interested in some of the more studies on and people pra practic practicing regenerative forms of agriculture where the numbers of, of animals are greatly reduced and worked into a system as a part of the system, not how much can we push the limits to get as much as we can out of it, you know, but like utilizing a small amount of grazers to help to mimic, you know, megafauna that helps to 
you know, and rotate them through well-timed and well-managed, like kind of stuff intrigues me, you know, because here in this region now, you know, some of the people that I can relate the most to are some of those older style uh, cattle ranchers that still manage them the way that they learned from the Nez Perce and the Cayuse, how to, how to take care of cattle mm. in this country, which okay. was following our seasonal rounds where the grass is coming on, where our foods are coming on. And then, so uh, some people out here, they're following, some of the people that are still following seasonal rounds are raising cattle on the seasonal rounds, you know, and not everyone's doing it ethically, but there are a lot of people that are doing it ethically. And, and it's not conducive to the health of other ecosystems, but it works here because the Wallowa Mountains and these canyons and the Blue Mountains produce a tremendous amount of grass, which is why the people here were known for their horse herds and people came from all over the place to trade horses with us because the conditions were right for it. And uh, that being said, even with lots of, you know, too many horses, we, we, we ruined some spots too. We may not ruin them, but tramp, maybe graze them a little too heavy and it turned maybe to more predominantly uh, some places from old stories were more just bunch grass with hardly any brush. And now they're sage and, uh, you know, juniper or whatever, and not as much bunch grass. So it's kind of like, but anyway, back to the topic of uh, adaptations with the changing of climate, you know, and with the increased population, because obviously we can't just, everyone go back to the first food life way. Like we can't do that because there's so many obstacles. And so I think some of these adaptations are part of that removal of obstacles or bringing in of things to help with food security, such as regenerative forms of agriculture. I really like food forestry, which is pretty much, you know, our first food system is a system of food forests and meadows, you know, so it's like similar but with some adaptations to bring in more, more species that to help us with some of these missing links uh, uh, to increase our protein sources and our fat sources. Um, but always thinking about the function of the, of the natural ecosystem, you know, and, uh, but yeah, so I, I think about things like, oaks you know like different types of oak that uh their habitats are changing you know to the south or down lower in elevation and some scientists are suggesting that their habitats are moving up and maybe it'd be a good idea to try to do some uh, climate change adaptation experiments and plant in some higher reaches higher elevations with different species so i think about stuff like that like you know we didn't really have much for acorns up in this country but we ate acorns you know we went down river and got acorns you know um, and we got a word for them they're a part of our diet you know and if their habitats are moving up you know we're kind of moving up like maybe we should try some of these kind of adaptation experiments of plants that are their niches are moving you know it's kind of a controversial topic for some but i think testing some out because i mean there's so many so much of the land is being utilized by things that weren't here 200 years ago so why not bring in some food forests of that have some a little bit of chestnut involved right. and a little bit of oak and whatever you know so yeah i think about those kind of things of and we'll incorporate some of that into this project of trying to get some different oaks established and um just kind of diversifying some of the food sources. You know, we've brought, uh, we planted some wapato in one of the wetlands here. And wapato was a more majorly known food source down uh, in, the, in the Columbia River, you know, closer to the main stem of the river, and then also up into like the Coeur d'Alene Lakes area. And, but, you know, it's found way up the Umatilla River, which from here isn't very far. It's found way up a lot of river channels naturally. And where this valley was completely manipulated and drained, you know, and then 
native plants were sprayed, burned off with all kinds of chemicals. And um, it's hard to say whether it was here or not. I've talked to people that say they found it naturally occurring in ponds on their property that weren't drained. So it leads me to believe that it was once here. But so anyway, we're working with, uh, you know, some of those kind of adaptations of bringing in some plants that maybe weren't super predominant here, but whose niches are kind of moving up and uh, climate change is maybe creating more opportunity for them to grow in higher elevation places. Because um, what's going to grow in some of those places are all these really crazy, uh, aggressive plants, you know, that, you know, I don't think some of them are as bad as people make them out to be, but it's like, might as well plant the thing that, you know, is more uh, native to the region and also can provide a tremendous amount of food. Like, like Wapato, it, it creates a, a potato that, you know, you gather in the fall. It's one of your last plant foods of the year you gather and you can get a tremendous amount of carbohydrates from it. And uh, Yeah, just all these things are excellent food sources and, a wapato, that's kind of like a lily pad, right? Makes a lily pad? It makes kind of arrowhead shaped leaf. Oh, that's um, right. Arrowhead yeah, it shaped kind of points leaf. points up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're thinking of Wokus. Wokus is more down in the Klamath Basin. Okay. Yeah. Klamath, Klamath Basin uh, bands of people subsisted heavily on Wokus, but up here more uh, wapato. Okay. And then the root would just grow down in the mud underwater. Yeah, you just kind of wiggle it out with your toes. And so mm -hmm. that's another one we've been working on revitalizing is knowledge of where it, you know, finding natural stands of it. And which has been kind of neat because with some different floodplains being reactivated lately, um, we've been finding it in some places where you now we're not sure if we, if the floodplain reactivated it or if we're just becoming more aware of it. So she's kind of showing herself to us more. Mm -hmm. Or maybe a little bit of everything, but we're starting to see it in more places that we never knew it was there. And so we're going to start, you know, hopefully we can get some surveys done of where some of these places are. And then, um, you know, perhaps where some of these places we can decide, let's get it established here. Maybe it was once there, but it's not anymore. Some different places where we can bring in some of these plants and, you know, I recently heard even the Umatilla National Forest um, is going to begin planting gamble oaks and pinyon pines in the southern Blue Mountains instead of their, you know, continuing to plant Doug fir and ponderosa, hmm. understanding that everything's changing and a lot of those conifers are dying off, while some of those plants from the south, their niche is moving north. And so... Yeah, I think there are there's room for playing around with some of that and seeing seeing how if we can work some of those adaptations in as the landscape changes. But it's like the more I spend time in these places and with the landscape in my local area, I realize like there's no better system than the one that existed here for thousands of years and like and it can still function and bringing back its function is the only way. Cause it's all so interrelated, like the bighorn sheep and the huckleberry and the salmon. And like, if you're trying to bring any one of those things back, you know, they're going to have challenges, you know, due to one of the things being missing because. Right. So bringing in a, a better way, I don't think is always the, the better way, you know, right. Cause there's a lot of people have their better way, but until you really take the time to sit with a place, you know, and learn what it has to has to offer. Um, it's kind of hard to just overshadow that with something else, and not without causing more damage inadvertently. That being said, there's a lot of damage being done as it stands. So some of these practices, I don't think, are going to hurt anything. But just to be careful with what we decide to do. And to always keep the natural function in mind, like so many little connections, you know, like, like down in California, I was just talking to a condor biologist 
David Mullen, he works for the Nez Perce tribe and he helped bring back Condor in California. And I, I was just blown away hearing the different hardships they faced, you know, like lead poisoning, making it hard. So just like one little, uh, input into the system or one thing taken out can make such a huge effect like with lead being on the landscape in the way it is you know from people shooting varmints with it and you know that as they brought back the condor they all of them had lead poisoning all the condor that are alive have lead poisoning to some extent you know and then then to raise their young they need a lot of calcium deposits in the form of shells and bone, you know, crushed up bones and stuff. And so they were finding that the, that the, they were having a hard time finding because there's not a lot of shells being deposited on the landscape anymore from people, you know, eating seafood and depositing their shells. Oh, there's not a lot of bone shards on the landscape because of people crushing bones, getting the marrow out. Huh, and like, okay. So even with that, the condors and the people living in that way, that natural law way of life are, are directly linked. Wow. You know? And so they were going around trying to find calcium for their young, having a hard time finding enough calcium for their young. And they were picking up, you know, a fire would go through Northern California there and explode a pot growers, PVC pipes or whatever. And so those condors were picking up shards of PVC pie, oh, no. whatever they could find that kind of resembled calcium and feeding it to their young, their young weren't making it. So it's just like you start to learn about any one species in the system and what their challenges are. You see how much it's all needed, you know? And so they were having to go out there and deposit shells and bring bones out and crush them up. And it's like, well, if we just never took the people away from the, the way of life and the landscape, a lot of these changes, right. these drastic changes wouldn't have happened, you know, but the damage has been done and we can learn from those mistakes and we can learn from the struggles that each other member of our extended family faces in their challenges to make a living for themselves on the landscape, like the beaver, like the salmon, like the condor, like any of them, you know, and so. And that's, again, why I think place-based solutions are so key. Like, I think it's within the reach of any place. Some places, you know, they might not have that guidance that stems back thousands of years, but but I'm pretty sure they do in some extent, you know. And so coming up with solutions based on place and the needs of the place, based on also the the natural function, the the healthy function of that place. So, and it's all linked, you know, fires, flooding. Um, it's all linked, you know. So all these plants out here are adapted to fires and flooding. And that's one of the biggest enemies of the valley settler is the fires and the flooding, you know. So we've been fighting against that for 100 years or so. And it's it's taken a backwards effect where now when the floods come they're really bad on you know on certain areas because the water takes those right angles and then the pressure has to release somewhere where those gradual braids absorbed all that pressure and released it into the roots of the functioning riparian zone ecosystem and marshes and wetlands to soak it in and now it all releases on Billy Joe's ranch down downstream, you know, and he gets his whole crop flooded out, you know, and then has to go through and spray the weeds with Roundup and replant and then gets flooded out again. And so it just takes a lot of input to keep it, to keep this, to keep this thing going. And, uh, right. But, you know, from what I hear within talking to different people in the community, there's, I think there's starting to be a change of, of thought even among some of the land managers now of wanting to designate different riparian buffers and bring back some of those native plants. And I think uh, industrializing even some of these things can corrupt them pretty quick. So I'm kind of skeptical of some things, but uh, 
But I think some of these things are at least a step in a better direction. You know, that's why I say that a lot, a step in a better direction. I don't think sure. it's the I don't think it's the end all, but at least we're kind of turning towards a better a better trajectory. So right. Right. So how can people follow the work that you all are doing out there and how can they support you? Uh, at the moment we're operating mostly like as far as sharing, it'll change over time, but you know, uh, with the evolution you can keep up, keep track. And, uh, but through Facebook, uh, Naknui Thlama Teach Amna, we have a Facebook page and, uh, I'll put a link then, in the show notes. Mm -hmm. And then in that, on that page, there's a link to, uh, cause right now we're working on getting our own nonprofit started. And in the meantime, working under the nonprofit status of the Ascension camp. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we've been writing grants and accepting donations uh, using their uh, 501c3 status as a separate, as like a branch uh, of our own. And so uh, there's a website on that link where you can go to donate and you just, there's a PayPal link and then you just specify that it's for caretakers of the land and uh, donations go right to our fund. And some people are weary of it because it is through a, a Christian organization, but it's totally, um, you know, they do the book work for us and, and all that, but we get, you know, we decide how the funds are allocated. And um, so it's, and then uh, hopefully within the next year, we'll start have our own nonprofit and, um, be a little more autonomous while still being collaborative with all the people we're currently collaborative with, but. Right. Right. And then um, people can follow along with the things you're doing on Instagram too. Yeah. I haven't been using Instagram as much lately, but yeah, we're on Instagram there too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Anything else you wanted to end with here? You know, I'm not sure. I think I kind of meandered around kind of like the rivers like to do. And, uh, hopefully touched on quite a bit of things that, you know, are on my heart and mind often. And yeah, I just encourage people to gain a literacy of the ecology around you, learn about how it functions and, you know, make choices based off of, of that function and, and just making sure we're not taking more than we need. So Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit radiofreesunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.